In this video, we will take a look at the basic tools to work on an HPC cluster. As I mentioned previously, to log into an HPC cluster, you will need a secure shell client, an SSH client, and these usually are pre-installed on Mac and Linux uh, laptops. And on Windows, uh, there is any number of open source or free SSH clients. We recommend MobXTerm, but you can use uh, PuTTY and a few others. And the, the idea is the same. You need a, a client on your system to access the remote cluster via secure shell encrypted connection. Let me show you how this is done on a Mac. Here I am on my MacBook. Uh, this is a local terminal. And this terminal on a Mac, you can usually find by going to Applications, Utilities, Terminal. And here I would type a command, ssh, my username, at sira.computecanada.ca. So this will let me log in as uh, myself, as Razumov, to the Sira system. So instead of logging to Sira, I will log in to our training cluster. And I will log in, I will use a username user120. That's a guest uh, account. And the training cluster is called Cassiopeia. It's Cassiopeia.c3.ca. So SSH, your username, at Cassiopeia.c3.ca. And here I am on the training cluster. This training cluster has software environment that is very similar to the production National Compute Canada clusters. You might have noticed that I did not have to type my password when I was logging into Cassiopeia. And the reason is I have set up a pair of SSH keys. There is a private key on my laptop and a public key in one of the subdirectories in my home directory on Cassiopeia. And that way, SSH does not ask me for a password. And this is super useful because you don't have to type a password every time you log into a remote system, every time you copy a file to and from the remote system, etc. Uh, if you need details on how to set up an SSH um, uh, key pair, you can find these details in our documentation, docs.computecanada.ca, and the links in the slides are actually all clickable, so you can go to uh, the main page on SSH keys, and there we have links to videos for Windows, Linux, and Mac laptops. The vast majority of work people do on our clusters is via uh, an SSH uh, text connection. We also allow graphical connection for some special workflows. You can open a VNC remote desktop type connection uh, on our, uh, to our clusters. So you can use the VNC protocol. There's also a tool called Axe2Go. And uh, you can uh, go to documentation, uh, just open uh, docs.computecanada.c. And in the top right corner, there is a search box. Search either for VNC or X2Go. And it will tell you how you can open remote desktops on our clusters. We also allow X11 forwarding through SSH. Uh, so this way, you can connect to remote cluster via, with, uh, by typing SSH-Y, and then your username at the cluster. And once you get a text uh, prompt the shell on the cluster, you can start a, an X Windows graphical application. And as long as you have an uh, X Windows X11 server on your laptop, uh, that will start a remote window uh, and display this remote window on your laptop. Uh, so unfortunately, these, uh, this is called X11 forwarding. This process is quite slow. It was designed in uh, the mid 1980s and it was not really meant for graphics heavy applications that we have today. And while it works, we really do not recommend it for you know interactive visualization, etc., because it's just going to be very slow. For that, we suggest either use remote desktops such as VNC or X2Go, or even better, use a client server workflow uh, that exists in many, uh, many applications. All of our systems run Linux, and that means that to be productive on these machines, you have to know the basics of uh, Linux command line. Uh, in this summer school, we have a course on Bash, the Linux command line, and I highly recommend that you watch the videos in that, uh, in that course to get familiar with the basic uh, commands in Linux. 
this slide shows you uh, the basic commands that we expect you to know in Linux to be productive on our file systems. So things like working with a file system, creating files, moving files, deleting files directories, etc., etc. Uh, so all these things are really important and make sure that you take a look at this material before you uh, start working uh, seriously on a cluster. Uh, this slide shows some typical things that we expect you to be able to do on a cluster. So these are basic tasks that you, you will often do in Linux. So things like create an archive out of a gzip archive out of a, a directory, move this archive into another directory and unpack it there, find files with uh, find, search inside a file for a pattern with crap, how to construct pipes, etc., etc. So all of these things we expect you to know. Editing remote files is really important because uh, typically you will have, you'll be working with the files on the cluster file system, whether it's in home or in scratch, and you won't have the ability to edit these files remotely. One option would be uh, to start a, an internal text editor, a non-graphical text editor, and that way you can edit a remote file right inside the terminal. Nano is perhaps the easiest option of all because it's such a basic text editor, but it's actually really good. And for novice users, we really recommend Nano. Let me show you how, how you can work with Nano. Here I'm back to the KCP system and I can type Nano followed by the name of a file. For example, I'm gonna say draft.txt and then I hit enter. And this opens a buffer into which um, I can type something. For example, this is a file. I'm gonna uh, save it, control X to save. Save modify buffer, yes. And then confirm the file name, so hit enter. And now I have a file, drop.txt, that I just created using the nano text editor. There are a number of other text-based text editors. For example, emacs-nv will open emacs without a graphical window right inside the terminal. There is also gedit, a few others. There is also vi, of course, and vim, vim. Um, you can also use a graphical, uh, graphical uh, text editor. We don't recommend opening a graphical text editor on the cluster and working with it through uh, X11, simply uh, because uh, this will uh, be quite slow and uh, frustrating because you will be working with uh, remote graphics. Instead, if you are used to Emacs, for example, if you are Emacs Power user, what you can do, you can actually start Emacs locally. It'll, it's going to be a local text editor on your laptop. And from the, this local text editor, you can edit a remote file. And the slide shows you how you can do that. Uh, there are also several other text editors that let you edit remote files through SSH connection. One of them is uh, Subline, another one is Atom, and I'm sure there are a few others that let you uh, do that. Here is a quick look at the cluster software environment. We have a large number of uh, compilers installed on our systems. So uh, the typical compile languages, so the usual high performance computing languages, C, C++, and, uh, and Fortran. We also support various uh, scripting languages uh, such as Python, R, uh, of course we have Java, MATLAB. Uh, we also support new languages, new parallel programming languages such as Chapel and Julia. And of course for all of this we have uh, various um, flavors. Uh, for uh, parallel programming, uh, for shared memory parallel programming, we have OpenMP. For distributed memory programming, we have MPI, which is a message passing interface library uh, that has APIs for pretty much any programming language. And of course, we have uh, Chapel and Julia that I mentioned before. These can be used for parallel programming as well. Uh, then for uh, GPU programming, we have CUDA. As you saw in one of the previous slides, all of our cards are NVIDIA. So that means that you can actually use CUDA to program these cards. We also have OpenCL and one of our compilers, PGI commercial compiler, uh, supports uh, OpenACC. OpenACC is by far the easiest way to program, uh, to do parallel programming on a GPU. Uh, basically OpenACC is a set of directives you can use in a programming language in C or Fortran. 
uh, that will let you uh, do some basic uh, parallelism, typically loop parallelism on a on a GPU. Uh, but that has to be supported by the compiler, and our PGI compiler license uh, supports it. Uh, because our classes are very large, so we have many, many hundred uh, compute nodes. Each compute node typically has several dozen, uh, dozens of processes. And then at any given time, uh, we have many hundred people using a cluster. Of course, uh, we need to automate all of that. And we're using an open source task manager and job scheduler called Slurm. So Slurm is used to uh, schedule jobs, uh, submit jobs from a login node uh, to compute nodes. And the idea is that if you need to do some computing, you uh, use uh, one of the Slurm commands, things like uh, asbatch or salloc, to specify how much memory you need, how many uh, processes you need, perhaps how many nodes you need, and perhaps even uh, how many uh, cores uh, processes per node, etc. Uh, whether you require any uh, GPUs, uh, maximum runtime, etc., etc. So you're asking for resources, you submit the job. And then once these resources are available, your job will start running. In terms of software, we have uh, several hundred packages and libraries installed on, uh, on our national clusters. If you click on uh, this link, this will open a web, a web page with a list of most software installed on our clusters. And then you can click on individual package to get more details. If you find that there is a tool or package or library that is not installed and you require it for your research, uh, let us know. And usually what we do, if this is a tool uh, that is open source and it can be compiled on Linux, then typically we'll help you compile it in one of your uh, directories. We can even compile it as you in one of your directories. If we have uh, multiple requests for the same software, then usually we try to install it centrally so that it's available uh, to all users. Uh, but basically, let us know. Send an email to support at computecanada.ca uh, with a software installation request, and we'll, we'll, we'll proceed from there. We also support um, commercial software. Uh, so sometimes we provide licenses for commercial software, things like MATLAB, uh, other packages. Sometimes you will need to bring your own license. But let us know, and we might be able to help you even with commercial software. Because we have uh, so much software installed on our system, we need to use an automated uh, system to switch between uh, different software pieces, between different versions of the same software, etc. And for that, we use the module uh, system. So on any cluster, if you type module avail and hit enter, that will return a large number of uh, packages that are available to you. Each package is, um, is distributed as a module. And then you can switch between these modules. Let me give you an example. Here I'm on the training, back to the training cluster, and I type module avail, and that will take a few seconds, and it will list a large number of packages. Here we go. And then I can also specify search for a specific package. For example, if I'm interested in GNU, uh, GNU compilers, open source compilers, I can type module avail GCC, and that will list all modules starting with GCC. So different versions of the GNU compilers we have. And as you can see, we have quite a variety of, of, of uh, different versions of, of the GNU compiler. So each GNU compiler provides compilers for C, C++, and, uh, and Fortran. If I am interested in Intel compilers, I can type module avail Intel, and that will give me a list of Intel compilers available on the system, and so on. Let's say I'm interested in Python. I will type module avail Python. And as you can see, we have uh, both Python, uh, Python 2 and Python 3 installed on the system. If you want to load a specific module, for example, I want to load the latest version of Python 3.8.2, I will type module load, followed by the module name. I hit enter, and that will load the module. To show the uh, currently loaded modules, you can type module list. And as you can see, uh, the Python module is among uh, the modules currently loaded. Now, if I type Python dash dash version, it will tell me that I'm using Python 3.8.2. Let's say I want to switch to Python 2. 
I'm going to type module load followed by the Python 2 module name. And as you can see, that will automatically unload the previously loaded Python 3 and will load Python 2. So that now when I type Python dash dash version, that will actually point to the Python 2 installation. So the nice thing about modules is that they will uh, treat dependencies for you automatically. If there is a dependency that needs to be loaded for that specific module, you don't have to load it by hand. The module system will, will do it for you automatically. So let me give you an example. Currently, I have the following modules loaded. So I have the Intel compiler uh, module loaded. And the Intel compiler module comes with another module, the dependency. OpenMPI is uh, uh, one of the implementations of the MPI message passing interface uh, library. And uh, here I have version 2.1.1. Uh, so this is the dependency of this uh, compiler module. Uh, the dependency in the sense that uh, this OpenMPI library has to be compiled specifically for the Intel compiler. Let's say I want to switch to a GNU compiler. I'm going to say module load GCC and that will replace my Intel compiler module with the default version of the GNU compiler 5.4. And as you can see, that also replaced reloaded the OpenMPI module because now the module, this OpenMPI module that I have loaded, now it's uh, the one that was built specifically to be used with the uh, GNU compiler 5.4. If I wanna unload a module, I can simply type module unload. Let's unload, for example, the Python module. And here we go. Uh, the command module avail uh, sometimes does not show all the options. And in those cases, you can, instead of typing module avail, you can type module spider followed by the name of the software that you're looking for. And that might give you more options. Finally, if you want to show more details about a specific module, you can type module show followed by the module name. And what this will do, it will actually show all the environment variables that are loaded by the module load command. And that's all a module does. It loads and unloads, uh, very, well, uh, sets and unsets various environment variables that are instrumental in finding a particular piece of software.